So again, it is truly my honor and pleasure to, to welcome everybody to our, our webinar today. Uh, we just have some outstanding speakers uh, to, to educate everyone on the osteointegration and the management of warfare injuries in the Ukraine. Um, our, again, as I said, our speaker today is Dr. Oleksandr Holozinski, and he is joined with uh, Dr. Janis Kolbenschlag, and the moderator, or the moderator today is uh, Dr. Andrew Lysak. So it's my pleasure to introduce today's moderator. I actually met Dr. Lysak in the beginning of 2023, so almost two years ago now, at our course in Rotterdam. Um, and it's been a pleasure knowing him and connecting at various meetings. Um, he helps volunteer on our education committee, which we are very grateful for. Dr. Lysak is a hand nerve and nerve reconstructing microsurgeon in Kiev, Ukraine. He has more than 12 years of experience. He is the head of the Department of Reconstructive Microsurgery and Orthopedic Surgery. And in 2020, he successfully passed the European Board for Hand Surgery. In 2022, he was a national representative in the Clinical Practice Committee of the Federation of European Societies for Surgery of the Hand. And in 2023, he was a recipient of the Laureate of the British Orthopedic Association Presidential Merit Award. So again, we're very thankful uh, to have him here today as our moderator. And with that, I will turn it over to Dr. Liza. Thank you very much, Stephen, and thank you all for joining us. Uh, as we said at our previous webinars, we start with the, uh, like a series of three webinars about the warfare injuries. Uh, first webinar, I have an honor to talk to you about uh, was about the peripheral nerve for warfare injuries, and today. Uh, we will speak about the integration. Unfortunately, uh, not always we can uh, save the limb or preserve the limb and uh, the surgeons uh, must perform an amputation. And what to do next after the amputation, how to, uh, what we can do, what's new in this, in what new technology can we have in, uh, in, in this field. Uh, today we will hear from uh, Dr. Halusinski and Dr. Kobenschlag, and that's an honor for me to present you uh, today two of our speakers, uh, Dr. Jonas Kobenschlag, he is a vice chair of the department and director of plastic surgery and plastic reconstruction and burn surgery trauma center in uh, Tübingen, uh, active reserve duty as a lieutenant colonel. Uh, he completed his, uh, like he said, that's not like a PhD, but associate professor thesis on the topic of prognostic factors for survival in patients with uh, sternal osteomyelitis undergoing reconstructive plastic surgery. Uh, he's a recipient of numerous awards, including the Best Oral Presentation Award for, in uh, Graz in 2021 and uh, Hamipla Best uh, Paper Award in 2014 and uh, 2080. He served as a secretary of the Congress of the German-speaking Working Group on the Microsurgery surgery and Peripheral Vessels and Nerves in Bochum in 2050, and he's a, a big friend of uh, Ukraine and of us. Uh, he, he's been in Ukraine for a few times since the beginning of the full-scale invasion and helped us to learn how to perform the uh, osteointegration, uh, what to do with these patients, and uh, how we can help them with it. So it's a big honor for us to have him with us today. And our next speaker is uh, Dr. Alexander Halusinski. He is an orthopedic and trauma surgeon with uh, more than 20 years of work experience. He is an author of more than uh, 65 publications and six patents, a member of uh, CICOT and Ukrainian Association of uh, Orthopedic Surgeons. Also, he trained at leading clinics of Belgium, Turkey, Czech Republic, Poland, Thailand, and India. Uh, carries out operations at different orthopedic and trauma uh, centers in Ukraine and co owner of the first biomedical engineering laboratory in the state, implementing an addictive technology into the orthopedic surgery. In 2019, he received an honorary diploma by the National Academy of Medical Sciences of Ukraine. 
Uh, and uh, I know Dr. Halzinski for a lot of years uh, for now, and uh, he was a pioneer of uh, the 3D printing technology in Ukraine and uh, of uh, also integration technology in Ukraine. And uh, it's a great pleasure for us to have uh, him with us today because uh, I think he has the more the most experience in uh, also integration and bionic prosthesis in Ukraine for now. So thank you very much. And uh, Alexander, the stage is yours. Uh, thank you very much, Andre, and uh, greetings for all. Greetings for all. Uh, let's start. Uh, one second, please. Okay. <clears throat> due, uh, due to Russia's military aggressions, uh, against Ukraine, the number of patients with amputations of limbs is growing every day, both among military personnel and among the civilian population. Rehabilitation and prosthetics of such patients is a difficult task, especially for patients with defective stumps. Also, integration is a revolutionary method of prosthetics, which I will tell you about in more detail. Also, integrative prosthetics, exo and prosthetics, limb prosthetics with skeletal attachment, limb prosthetics in which the prosthesis is attached directly to remaining bone of the amputated stump with the help of interocellus implant. The first hip osteointegration operation was performed in Sweden in 1990 by Professor Brannemark. At the moment, about 2,500 oper uh, operative interventions have been performed in the world. Speaking about the relevance of OSI integration, I will quote our colleague, Professor Horst Ashov. Traditional prosthesis for people with transfemoral and transtibial amputations have been the gold standard for decades. For decades. However, such pa patients face many problems in restoring autonomous mobility. According to estimates, 30 persons for all amputees report unsatisfactory rehabilitation, and 10 persons can cannot use a traditional prosthesis at all. The photo shows the stamp of the sheen of one of our patients who uses a traditional prosthesis. An indication for integrative prosthetics is the presence of a short of or defective amputation stump, the prosthetics of, uh, of which with a traditional prosthesis in ineffective. Important conditions for choosing this prosthetic method are the patient's ability to undergo rehabilitation and the ability to care for the stoma. Contraindications. Incomplete osteogenesis, congenital and acquired uh, bone deformities, osteomyelitis of the bone of the stump, an infectious, infectious process in the area of the skin of the stump, osteoporosis, the patient is older than 65 years and younger than 22 years, the patient's body weight exceeds one, one, uh, 100 kilograms, we talk about opera system now, Occlusive diseases in the vessels of the limbs, diabetes with complications, neuropathies and severe phantom pain in the area of the stump, pregnancy, mental illnesses. Today there are, there are two types of fixation of osteointegrative prosthesis in the bone, press feet and screw feet. The press feet implant is driven or pressed into the bone marrow canal after processing with special reamers. This is a one-stage technique. Screw feet implants on the right are screwed into the bone. Usually this is a two-stage technique, but sometimes more often on the shoulder. It is possible to install the implant and abutment in one stage. Despite the fact that manufacturers is of uh, press-fit implants claim the possibility of early loading, 
the unconditional advantage of screw feed implants is the possibility uh, of their use in super, in super short bones of amputation stumps. These two techniques also differ in the treatment of the soft tissue of the stump. The abutment of the press feed implants is coated with titanium nitride, nit nitride on which the soft tissue slide. Serous, uh, serous discharge is normal according to the manufacturers. Such a stoma is called wet. When using the two-stage screw feed te uh, technique, the soft tissue are tightly <clears throat> tightly fixed to the bone cut, forming a dry stoma. In our center, we use screw feed implants from Integrum Opera. During the first stage, an implant of pre-selected size is screwed in and a special plug is installed. We perform bone grafting of the end of the bone in order to seal the implant. This also allows for a slight lengthening of the bone if necessary. Uh, the second stage is usually performed after 3-4 months. It consists of removing the plug elements. We remove the muscles about 1 cm proximally from the bone cut. Using purse string sutures, we form a, a muscle platform compacting the soft tissues. An important stage is the careful formation of the stoma on the skin flap. This must be done so that the skin grows to the bone, avoiding the treat of its necrosis. Finally, we install the abutment. The philosophy of this technology is that the less movement of soft tissues occurs in the stoma area, the fewer complications. Now a little about our center. We owe our development in the field of OS integration uh, to Professor Ricker Brennemark. He came to Kyiv three times, taught and certified our surgeons. He is an excellent specialist and a true humanist. I hope he can hear me now. Uh, 50, 51 patients were operated on at the center. 55 surgical interventions were performed. 22 osteointegrative hip prosthesis, 31 shoulder prosthesis, 1 tibia, 1 forearm. 14 patients underwent targeted muscle reinnervation. We did TMR both to reduce phantom pain and to create additional sites for controlling the bionic hand. But Jonas will tell us about this today. All patients were men, military personnel, who took part in the Russian-Ukrainian war. The average age is 36 years old. Pay attention to the X-ray on the right. We were able to do also integration with a humerus remnant <clears throat> of only uh, 64 millimeters. We analyzed the causes of amputation in our patients. Traumatic amputations, secondary injuries due to tourniquet syndrome, or planned amputation due to failed reconstructive surgeries. Tourniquet syndrome was dominant. Foreign bodies were found in the soft tissue of amputation stumps in 25 to 35 of cases, more often in traumatic amputations due to mine explosion wounds. In our opinion, this point should be given special attention, since any foreign body can be a source of infection. In general, the topic of infection interests everyone who hears about us integration for, for the first time, both patients and doctors. And such a problem does, uh, does exist. It is a leading among, uh, among compli uh, complications. Fortunately, in most cases, it is superficial. On this slide, we see the types of microorganisms that we are isolated from our patients. Many of them are resistant to antibiotics, and this is typical for combat trauma. 
Enterococcus fecalis, Pseudomonas aeruginosa, Meticillin resistant Staphylococcus aureus, Sclipsiella pneumonia, and combinations Staphylococcus epidermidis and Staphylococcus aureus. It is very important not to be afraid to do a revision of the postoperative wound with the debridement in time. This was effective in three cases out of seven. In two cases, we had to do a second revision. We took away the plug elements and temporarily replaced them with a reinforced salmon spacer with an antibiotic. And we are pleased with, with the result. On the side, you can see X-rays before after treatment. But unfortunately, two of our patients developed a deep periprosthetic infection and the implants had to be removed. Although this is not too many, less than four persons of cases we are working to reduce the number of complications. And we have proposed a technique of uh, preoperative biopsy of the bone marrow canal with a subsequent microbiological examination of the material. In some cases, infection was detected. For now, we refuse our integration to such patients. Solving, surg uh, solving surgical issues is not everything. Osteointegrative prosthetics is a team game of surgeons, prosthetists, psychologists, and rehabilitation specialists. We come to conclusion that osteointegration should be done by special specialized centers. Rehabilitation is an important stage on which the final result might happen. I would like to briefly talk about rehabilitation protocols. In the case of the low, lower limb, six weeks after surgery, actual load of 20 kilograms begins. <clears throat> the pressure increased by 10 kilograms every week. Uh, 10 to uh, 14 weeks, full weight exercises are performed and a full length prosthesis is allowed. Week 10 to 14, training with a full length prosthesis. Rehabilitation protocol after the second stage of also integration of the shoulder. You can see training set in room. Exercises begin with a weight of 100 grams placed approximately two times a day for two hours. Gradual weight uh, gained during the week. Pain control according to the VAS scale. Actual load starts from 5 kilograms two times a day. The maximum pressure is 10 kilograms. We analyze the pain syndrome the patients experience during rehabilitation. Bone pain syndrome was observed in most cases and is considered by us as a normal adaptation process. Patients feel it during actual load on the abutment and it serves as an important indicator of the load. Myofascial syndrome occurred in the form of antithepatis in the area of the nearest joint and was well treated with uh, physiotherapy and short courses of non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. Phantom pain increased in some patients, but this, is, uh, this was a short-term phenomenon. In some cases, we successfully used augmented reality, a method proposed by, uh, by Max Catalan, but this is a, uh, the topic of separate report. By the end of the rehabilitation, all our patients got rid of pain. And uh, you can see an interesting uh, photo. It's uh, patients from uh, our rehabilitation center with uh, different types of osteointegration implants, uh, left side, uh, opera system, medium uh, OTN system, and right side OPL. In the photo, uh, in, uh, in the photo you see a, a unique case, rehabilitation for a triple amputee with a triple os integration and the level of the hip, shoulder, and forearm. On this slide, you can see special devices that are 
com uh, compatible with OS integration. They allow patients to swim and play sports. Sports are a very important aspect of social activity for our veterans. Summing up, we can confidently say that OS integration is the future. All our patients noted an improvement of in their quality of life. Uh, also integration uh, prosthesis, prosthesis is more comfortable, reliable and fast fixation of the exoprosthesis, improved proper reception, full range of motion in the joint adjacent to the amputated segment, reduction of phantom pain. In this video, our patient Alexander, who used a bionic osteointegrative prosthesis, he also underwent TMR and uses a co-opt prosthesis control system. Interesting that uh, this patient with a short uh, shoulder amputation stump and uh, he works as a bioengineering in uh, our laboratory of uh, bionics. It's a very cool for me. And this uh, slide shows our future electronic opera. As a technology we, which is being improved is that electrodes are implanted into the patient's body and allow the prosthetics to move without interference. I hope the information I shared with you was interesting. I would like to separately note that our center, together with the Sitenka Institute of Spine and Joint Pathology, has planned a scientific uh, uh, research to uh, new topic as the Academy of Medical Science of Ukraine on OS integration for 2025 to 2027 years. Uh, the first results were presented at SciCode in Belgrade uh, this year. And we also have our first publication in Scopus, uh, uh, Scopus publication. Conclusions. All, pa all patients who were fitted with osteointegrative limb prosthesis and who underwent protocol rehabilitation measures not an improvement in the quality of life and functional results. Septic complications dominated among early postoperative complications. In most cases, we were able to cure the infectious process without removing the implants. During the rehabilitation period after the second stage of osteointegrative, uh, osteointegrative prosthetics, patients experience the following types of pain syndrome, bone, myofascial, and phantom pain. Regression of ben, bone pain syndrome was observed in all patients who followed the integrum rehabilitation protocols within the expected time frame. Effective osteointegrative Prosthetics requires the creation of highly specialized centers. Thank you for all attention. We are interested in any scientific and uh, practical cooperation. Please contact us with any questions by email or WhatsApp. Thank you very, uh, thank you very much for your attention. I try to do my best and just give some surgical impressions from Ukraine, and I, I gave that name. Uh, on default because I have some disclaimers. I try to be as non-politic as one can be. 
Uh, it's my personal opinion, it's highly subjective, and I've not been in the country for six months, unfortunately, but I still try to get you some insights because I get asked the question about how did you get there, what did you do there, stuff like that. So we try to get into that a little bit. Um, so first of all, how come you go to Ukraine? So you know you know the guy in the middle uh, by now, this is Alexander, great talk before me. Uh, this is another Alexander, he's the deputy director of the center. And this is Slava, uh, he's uh, the creator of a charitable foundation, the Life Saving Center. And this young man here is Richard Brandenmark, we heard a lot about him as well. And um, I did some OI cases in Germany with Richard, and he was telling me that he was going to Ukraine, that he had a, a request for him to go to Ukraine and do Austrian integration. And I said, if you go to Ukraine, you need to bring me. And well, and then he did, so he brought me. And then we met up in Kiev with, with Alexander and Slava and everybody, and it was just a great experience. But the next question is now you know where to go. The question is how do you get there, okay? Uh, because traveling is not so easy to Ukraine. Um, and uh, I live in a tiny town in the south of Germany. So I had to take a train and a bus and another train and a flight to get to Warsaw. And then you can take a train to the easternmost border of Poland. And then you take another train for 16 hours to go to Kiev. And if you know the German rail system, yeah, it's not known for its punctuality. And we were scheduled to arrive in Kiev at, at 10 before 7 in the morning. And at the time we arrived in Kiev, it was actually five minutes before that. Okay, so 16 hour train ride and we were five minutes early. So I was really impressed with the start in Ukraine. That was great. That was much better than Germany. Um, so um, I was interested in how the situation on the ground was and when we were checking into the hotel. This was the, one of the first signs I saw in the hotel. So. I think it's it's great that people, even in those darkest of times, are able to to preserve some kind of humor. Um, and then you get a QR code where you scan and you get your link to your air alert app, which alerts you every time there's an air raid alert. Um, as you see, this is a screenshot from one day. It's, it's quite often the case. Uh, and I remember the first night being there, I was in a hotel, it was somewhere at night, and the air alert went off. And uh, the obedient German that I am, I went down the stairs to go to shelter and I checked with the with the night clerk and he was browsing through a, through a literature, uh, through a magazine. I said, okay, we need to go to shelter. Where do we go? And he was like, we don't go to shelter anymore. And then I went back to bed and that was the, that was the shelter thing for the rest of the trip. So the situation on the ground is actually pretty normal on the surface. And, I'm, and I really want to to express my gratitude for the hospitality that we that we were offered so it's it, it was incredible people invited us to to eat with them to their homes to every it was i was really taken care of very well it was a great trip and uh, the video i'm showing now is not to show you that they have running water no not not the least this is the high-tech no touch scrub in machine at the mirror clinic in my university hospital in germany if you want to scrub in and you need water you need to hit the sink really hard with your hip and break your hip and then you get maybe you get water and ukraine much better so there's a lot of stuff going on there. Um, and then you take some normal like uh, holiday shots you would take on your normal holiday trip, obviously. Um, and then what I learned about this is Michael, one of the volunteers, he was a great help. Um, and um, he takes, they take care of a lot of medical stuff. Um, and uh, I think most of the people are now worried, especially with the election now in the US, are worried about how it's going on with supplies and donations. Um, and I found it really cool that even the small donations we were able to give or just that we were present in the country, that somebody from Elf was coming and actually doing stuff on the ground. I think it was very well perceived and um, I think the will is still unbroken and I'm, I admire these people for their bravery. And it's interesting because when I came the first time, I was fully packed for a war zone. I had a full-fledged IFAC, I had a cry kit, I had everything with me. Um, and then I realized I don't need this stuff. So I gave it away to, to the volunteers and then like a few months later, uh, Alexander, please check if the Google Translator did not mess up, but this is what Google Translate made out of it. Yeah. So um, he sent me a, a WhatsApp that that actually the the small donations, this IFAC has saved some lives. So I think it's just it's just great to see that even little things can make a big difference. And this is also something I, I, I try to keep in mind every time. So that's great. Um, and then this is already the patient collector we're talking about. Alexander, did you give that very well? And uh, why is it? Why do we see so many proximal amputations? It's due to the high and tight tourniquet, um, but it's also to very prolonged rescue times. We have rescue times that are far longer than other other conflicts that we draw our data from. So most of our data in this regard is from the global war on terror, and the GWAT data is totally different because in GWAT we had air superiority, we had air medivac, we had everything, um, and now this has changed. So there are a lot of patients with major amputations, as Alexander said, and a lot of them are very proximal amputations, and these are patients that are very hard to, to uh, get mobile again with a conventional prosthesis. 
you saw these pictures, and I think this is just amazing how short the stumps can be. I think it was six point something, Alexander, for the for the uh, humor and and for the femur, it was also very short. So I think it's the shortest you can go. Um, and then we did like those those were the surgeries we did uh, in the first trip with Rika. We did a lot of osteointegration. The second trip we did mostly TMR for these patients and the stage two osteointegration. So about five complete TMRs with stage two in in about five days. So that was pretty busy. And uh, we also did a lot of this together with our colleagues, and and now they are able to perform all these surgeries perfectly on their own osteointegration and also TMR. So that's just great to see. As Alexander said, I was rehabilitation is just a major part of all these things. So I was worried a little bit because rehab in Germany for those patients was quite hard to get organized. And I, I said, okay, we, we can do this super sophisticated stuff, but we have to have really good rehabilitation. And I was blown away by the amount of love and, and attention that went into these things. So the rehabilitation process is just, just really great. And you know this guy, he's uh, you know his archery skills already, and they have those basketball matches together. And it's especially like Alexander says, so... Uh, it's just a tight knit community, and uh, he's working in the lab and training other people, other patients with prosthesis. So I think this is just a perfect example of rehabilitation, not only on the medical level but also on the psychosocial level. Um, that's just that's just great to see see these things happen. And uh, and then I keep track of these patients via social media, and you see that he's training and that he's having TMR. It's the first TMR case we did um, back on the first trip, um, and it's just. Great to see how it works and how prosthesis technician everything just gets better and helps him as you saw in the video from alexander just just get better function out of that lost limb and uh it's also something that i wanted to see kiev again because like 20 years ago i had some business trips to kiev uh so i remember the city and uh in all those days we were there we had one day off we fought hard for that <laughs> for that one day holiday trip and we we went to see kiev and went around kiev and it's just it's just as a great city as i remember it to be um, because this often just gets lost in all this, in all these dark thoughts and trips and everything. So I think it's important to remember um, how great the people, how great the city and how great the country is. I think that's just very important. So in the end, it just comes down to teamwork. You know, these people on these slides, the Rickard and the colleague from orthopedics, I think we need to do this together and we need to work together. This is the OR crew from the second trip, um, where I was joined also by another German surgeon from Berlin, Martin. Um, it was just a great trip and I learned so much. Um, and uh, I draw some conclusions and I split them down. So as Andrew said, I'm also an active duty reserve uh, medical officer in the German army. So I have a great interest in tactical medicine. And if you share these, then these slides are for you. So I think we need to rethink tourniquet use, tourniquet application and training for that. It's very important. Uh, we have to rethink all our global war and terror data because it's not fitting this type of scenario that we're facing now. Uh, we need more forward surgical capabilities. Uh, we need a management uh, for on a strategic level for high casualty counts. Um, and I think it's great because TCCC now provides all their material in Ukraine, uh, in Ukraine language. So that's perfect. You can go to the TCCC side and you get all their information, which is priceless and life-saving. And you get it all in English and in, in Ukrainian. I think that's just really, really great. Um, with regards to nerve surgery, I think um, all the people I met in Ukraine are highly capable, highly motivated, highly trained, and very competent in many fields. And I think um, they, if they need expertise, maybe it's just focal expertise, like specific for OI, specific for team or stuff like that. And I also think on the scientific side, we, we it lends itself to scientific corporations regards to OI, regards to phantom limb pain, because as as horrible this war is, I think we have the obligation to get to learn the most from it. And uh, and to do research and learn and be better prepared and to help patients in a better way. Um, I think that's our duty. And I think that's great that the GNF is giving us this opportunity to get together and talk about these things. So in the end, I think we need to identify the needs. Where can we help the most on each individual level? Um, because I see a lot of top-down approaches to help Ukraine, a lot of working groups and stuff like that. And sometimes I have the feeling that they work like very in a very confused manner in every way. So the bottom up way that the uh, that people on the ground are saying, okay, get us this, we need this, we get there, we need this expertise. I think this is extremely tremendously helpful and um and can help to to manage help in a better way because there are so many people that are willing to help, but most of them just don't even know how to. So you're one of these people just get in touch with Andrew, with Alexander, with me, um, and we will try to figure something out. Um and the great thing I learned on this trip, I learned a lot of things on this trip, but I think it's just beautiful as a surgeon. You can go anywhere in the world and you go to the OR and it's like you go home every time because the language is the same. 
the jokes are the same, the people are the same. It's just great to have this universal language. I think we're incredibly blessed as surgeons to have this. And uh, why did I put a surgical scissor there? Because I learned only a few words in Ukrainian, but one of them, I was always asking for my specific scissors because I brought a specific pair of scissors with me on the trip. And uh, those are Stevens and Orthonomy scissors. And uh, uh, in Germany, I always call them wonderful scissors. And then the nurses taught me how to say it in Ukraine. And Alexander, Andrew, please tell me if I'm wrong, but it's, it's Chudovi Noshitsi, I think. I hope at least. It's wonderful scissors. This is one of the things that I learned. And I will remember to the end of my days the Chudovi Noshitsi for those wonderful scissors. And uh, thank you to the brave people of Ukraine. Um, I think it's, it's, I cannot comprehend what you're going through. And uh, I have the utmost respect for everything you do. Um, and yeah, just thank you so much. And thanks everybody for going through this talk with me. And uh, yeah, feel free to ask any questions you might have. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you very much, John, uh, Jonas. And uh, I would ask you to show your slide about revised tourniquet procedure, because one of our attendees asked for- This one? Yes. Uh, can it be in the screen for a few minutes? Because uh, attendees ask for this slide. Yeah. So we we have uh, like a two questions for now. Uh, first one was, uh, what are the rates of loosening between the implant and the bone uh, in your experience? So, Alexander? Mm -hmm. um, situation is, uh, uh, is an accident. It, it is a not uh, arthroplasty. And we don't uh, we don't have um, products of uh, friction, uh, and uh, we don't have macrophagial reaction uh, between bone and uh, implant. We know that uh, implants uh, that was uh, uh, installed uh, in nineties. Uh, uh, people use it and uh, they have a good uh, good results uh, reason of uh, instability of implant uh, is a septic complication we know only about septic uh, instability thank you Jonas maybe you have some experience uh, not so much with the loosening because I think um I think the point is that um, the, the oldest data we have is is rather old and it's different implants. So I think Rickard will will could tell us more about this. But I know that there's a study from Walter Reed which has the largest series today before Alexander uh, took over the the largest series. I think and they have um, really low loosening rates in the upper extremity and and a little bit higher in the, in the lower extremity. But I think overall it's it's a valid concept and you have to think of one thing that it is uh, in, in the in the rightly selected patients it's your only chance to get to preserve mobility and re to retain him. So you don't have that much to lose. And in those cases where I was talking with Rickard about, I know it's not how your experience is, but um, and they were able to preserve at either the implant or if they had to remove the implant, they preserved the stump length nearly to the, to the length they had before. So you don't go to a high amputation level, uh, only in the rarest of cases. So you don't lose too much in that way. And in these patients, it's often it's your only chance to get sufficient prosthesis rehabilitation. Okay, thank you very much. So we have another uh, question from our audience. Uh, what are the solutions for pediatric amputees? Any integrative approaches? Mm -hmm. uh, there are not. Uh, there are no uh, solution in a pediatric uh, mm, pediatric field because uh, uh, gross area of the bones. Uh, must be closed and uh, uh, young uh, young age uh, before 21 years is a uh, uh, contra contraindications uh, for, contraindication for osteointegration thank you well, Jonas. Think, yeah, I think in these patients um, we have to reconsider like the pediatric te techniques we used uh, differently, for example, for us as a coma patients where we use like growing fibula with the growth plate or stuff like that um, to, to have more autologous reconstruction because, because they qualify per se for OI. Um, also, not only to the, to the uh, epiphysis, but also to the diameter of the bone because we need at least 
uh, a minimum diameter uh, of, of medullary canal. And that might be, might be a problem. So maybe this is something to refer to back to like fibula with growth plate, autologous reconstruction, stump elongation maybe, uh, or walking procedures or stuff like that. Yeah. Okay, thank you. So I will ask for more questions from the audience. And uh, for now, I have one question for both of you. Uh, what is the short shortest stump that you can perform the Austin integration? Uh, 64 millimeters, if you talk about shoulder uh, stump. Uh, the shortest uh, implant uh, have uh, 60 millimeters and uh, when we uh, when we use it implant sometimes we need to use a uh, uh, bone allograft uh, and uh, uh, I think that uh, um, screw fit implant have advantages and we can use uh, this implant uh, if we have only a head of uh, shoulder for example okay Jonas? yeah i totally agree so i think that the pictures you saw are among the shortest stumps that are possible at this point in time with the technique we have and with the implants we have and for the femur implants i think you we there's a technique that that alexander Rickard and we came up with is that you can go through the crater trochanter and perforate which and you cannot do that in shoulder obviously because then you're in the clangoral joint but you can do that in the femur so you can elongate and have a secondary cortical contact point so you can kind of play around those limits um but the femurs you show in Alexander's in my presentations they are already very very short thank you very much we have one more question from the audience are there uh, any novel materials that materials uh, that can be used to prevent infection? Are all of the osteointegration inter integration implants made out of titanium at the moment? Mm -hmm. um, at this, mom at this moment, uh, osteointegration integration uh, implants made from uh, titanium. Uh, I don't know about uh, uh, new materials uh, better than uh, titanium, uh, but uh, we think we think about uh, um, how to do surgical technique uh, better. What we what we uh, what we can use um, for fighting with uh, uh, infection, and maybe our next uh, stage of uh, our research will be using of. Uh, bacteria fox for uh, for treatment uh, antibiotic resistant infections uh, we hope it will be work yeah i also think that that as you said so um, obviously you can do like uh, surface treatment stuff like that and maybe there can be improved but i think the most crucial improvement is soft tissue management as a plastic surgeon obviously i'm going to go for the soft tissues yeah but i think soft tissue management is just paramount in in these cases and you may never forget that we're talking about more or less acute wartime injuries sustained during a classical battle. So this is these are shrapnel wounds, these are contaminated wounds to begin with. So in that collective, this is already a maximum negative selection of, of cases, you know what I mean? So this is actually a very low risk of infection given this patient populace. Um, and I think that's also something, and I think soft tissue management is crucial. And I also think that soft tissue management is easier and to do better in a, in a screw fit implant than in a press fit implant. Thank you very much. Uh, and that's all questions for now. And I think we have only five minutes till the end of our webinar. So uh, maybe, Stephen, you can uh, unmute yourself and present our next webinar, the third of the series. <laughs> yeah, so next month we should be having TMR. We're wrapping up a few of the details. So I'll send those out um, after... Uh, or with the follow-up from this webinar. Um, but I would like to take a couple minutes just to thank the three of you uh, for not only being here today, but just everything that that you do, um, not only you know the lives that uh, you're touching, saving, uh, helping restore function, um, everything that that you do. it's it's truly an honor and a, and a pleasure for uh, for me to 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 just even be able to be a part of this conversation today and, and all the great work that that you're doing. So thank you all uh, for being here and, and for what you do. And we will send some follow up
for anyone who um, attended today or couldn't attend and would like to watch the, the webinar. Um, if there's any information, you know, if people are interested in getting involved, maybe we could find get some information as well for them to who to reach out to um, and, uh, and, and contacts that they could make. So we'll try and, and provide some of that when we send our follow up. But, uh, but again, uh, thank you to the, the three of you. Um, it was a great, uh, great last two webinars and, uh, and for everything you're doing. And we will, uh, we'll send follow up in the next probably couple of days. Thank you very much for organizing all this <laughs> stuff, Steve. And uh, thank you all for being with us together uh, today. And we hope to see you our next webinar. And of course, I want to thank uh, the speakers that they find out their time and their uh, really hard work schedule. So uh, thank you, Alexander. Thank you, Jonas, for being with us today. Uh, thank you, and thank you for all colleagues. Thanks, everyone. Thanks so much, everybody. Bye. Stay safe. Bye-bye.